Hi guys, <laughs> I'm back. I'm sorry I've been away for a little while. A few things going on. There's going to be another video um, probably in a week's time and I will tell you all what has been going on. I have tried to stay in touch on the sort of uh, community tab and everything. I don't know how many people actually look at that. If you go onto my channel on YouTube and at the top of the screen you would see um, it says home videos community and then about on the community tab i often post if i can't put a video up or um, a sneak peek sometimes just to remind you of videos that you might not have seen all of that kind of thing so what do you call these let's jump right into it why not what do you call these there's lots and lots of these because someone's been making lots of them so over here in the uk we call them Suffolk Puffs apparently. <laughs> I thought that was quite interesting. I know in the States they are called uh, yo-yos and they've also uh, just called Puffs. They can be called rosettes I think. All sorts of things and what they actually come from as far as I can find out because I wanted to do some history for you. I wanted to find out their origin, how long they've been used for, where they originated. Obviously the fact that they're called Suffolk Puffs means that somebody in Suffolk <laughs> I used them and called them that at some point and the name got adopted. But I'm guessing that's not the first place they were used, it's just a name that's stuck. You do see them in a historical fashion and you do see them, I'm going to do something terrible now, you see how it's all nice and flat this one. You do see them on clothing like that and they have many all together stitched round and you can see if you did them in different sizes, overlap them, you could get something that looked like a petal shape. And then those ones you never see, or not I've seen in any garments and photographs that I could find, you never see this middle part. You only ever see these, there's, there's usually like a, a button or a, another puff of fabric stitched over it. So that's where I found them in historical clothing. I can't put any links to them because they all the ones I managed to find are copyrighted so I'm sorry about that. Also uh, yet to find them in um, any other books except this one. I'm not sure why. I don't know if it's because it's a three-dimensional thing and it's not technically a quilty thing although they've been adopted into the quilt making world. I, I really don't know why and in all the research I found it just goes to show everyone reads the same articles online for example, in every single one I found, they said, oh, the Suffolk Puffs have, or yo-yos have been used since 1601. Very specific, 1601. Can I find the source that they're referring to? No. <laughs> I haven't found the original article with the credited museum collection or garment or whatever, but as a quilting thing, apparently these have been used since 1601. But I, I couldn't find that. I'm so sorry that I couldn't find that. In this book, they're called Yo-Yos. I love her introduction. She puts um, frivolous, fragile and featherlight. Yo-Yo quilts provide a welcome distraction from the more serious business of accurate piecing and careful stitching. Also called Suffolk puffs, rosettes and bonbons. Yo-Yos are quick to prepare and assemble. They're perfect for quilters with plenty of scraps and not much time. I would dispute the not much time. It took me ages to make these. I've made 32 of them and honestly, I would rather stitch hexagons any day. These are fiddly, 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 but they're fun. And then it uh, goes on to say, you don't need padding or backing. Yo-Yo projects do not afford much warmth. I would dispute that as well, especially if you put it on a background. But over the years, they've found their own niche in the quilting world and are mostly made into summer weight coverlets, shawls and wall hangings. So because they're mostly made into coverlets, shawls and wall hangings, we're going to make something different today so that I can show you. We are going to make a cushion. So I started off with my only remaining cushion pad. It's a boot our cushion and I really really need to get some cushion pads but what I usually do is I buy them you know end of line and stuff like that so they usually don't match in size they are the often marked down to a couple of pounds or whatever. This is my last one from my stock. So mine's going to be a boudoir cushion. So I measured it, sort of. I measured it with some yo-yos. So I put them across like this and worked out how many I needed. So I did them like across and then uh, across the length as well and worked out how many needed. Apparently I need 84. Yeah, that's quite a lot, isn't it? 
so hence the reason why I started so far ahead of time. These are all made out of silk. I suggest you don't make them out of silk. It's really, really fiddly. You need a lot of scraps and things and if you haven't got scraps, if you've got squares of silk, you end up with lots of circles cut out of them. However, I do have a lot of scraps of silk from a commission I made about five years ago. So I got all of those out. And so I've got all these lovely different colours. So I've, I've just literally pulled out what I got. Um, this is not a special colour palette or anything. Lots of rusts and browns and purples. Uh, lots of shot ones and actually they do look really effective when they're stitched because you get the shadows made out of the the other colour. So this is shot with a turquoise and uh, brown. And I want to back the cushion, the background. I'm going to use this purple. Originally I was going to do it on this green and then realised I hadn't got any green. This is all I've got left. And I just, I just think it looks really cute. I think it looks really, really effective. It just shows it off like that. And there's something about silk, like you get with anything uh, with a slight sheen to it. I found this before with ribbons and with silk as well. Is somehow just mixing a whole jumble of colours together it just looks great. They all, they all look really nice together. So, we're making them because ages ago, one of my subscribers dropped a comment on a video. I couldn't tell you which one it was, you'll have to go and watch them all. She asked me if I'd ever done anything with Suffolk Puffs or yo-yos and would I ever do something with that. So here we are, this one's for you. Um, we are going to do a thing with Suffolk Puffs. Because I can't do anything in a sort of straightforward way, um, I thought we'd also make it a little bit interesting by using a gadget, which I don't normally do, but I happen to have one. Usually, if you're making one of these, um, you would make yourself a template out of some fairly sturdy card, which is twice the size of the finished circle you want. These measure um, about one and three quarter inches across. So it must have started out as being nearly four inches, three and a half inches across the circle. So you would draw a circle on a template, on a piece of card, cut it out, and then you would cut out your circle with a seam allowance. And then in here it just says, cut a circle of fabric, double the desired size of the yo-yo, fold the edges a quarter of an inch to the wrong side, not a length of sturdy thread and work short even running stitches all around the circle securing the folded edge. I would say it's easier than that, trying to guess that you've got it in the right place. If you make yourself a template you can iron it and you can take it to the ironing board and just iron a load of the hem allowance around and then you can just sit and stitch a whole pile of them all together. I would do some preparation first and I wouldn't ever try and guesstimate that because it's kind of important that they're round in this one. So that's what she suggests. I, on the other hand, am not going to do that and I'm not going to show you how to draw a circle either, I'm sorry. We are going to try out this, <laughs> which is a quick yo-yo maker quick and easy to make your beautiful yo-yos. Stitch your yo-yos together and make various kinds of handiwork. It comes with measurement -y things, suitable materials. It says required items for making a yo-yo fabric approximately four and three eighths. Oh, that was more than what I said. Four and three eighths of an inch by four and three eighths of an inch. For sewing with a single thread, hand sewing, there's all sorts of like how much thread you need. You can use suitable materials. It says use thin to regular thickness fabric, sheetings, broadcloth. What is broadcloth? Does anyone know? Etc. Soft fabric with draping properties, strong hand sewing thread, quilting thread, etc. Oh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't use embroidery thread for this. It'd be a waste anyway, but it would snap. Do not use medium thick to thick fabric. Do not use denim, felt, thick wool, etc. Hard or coarse fabric is not suitable. And don't use threads that easily break with a strong pull. Mm, embroidery thread, etc. Or machine sewing thread. I would dispute the machine sewing thread. You can use that because that's what I've used. And it comes with some very, very confusing 
instructions. To be fair to Clover, I suspect it's because they have four different languages on here. I think they're trying to make it absolutely foolproof. For someone like me, who's dyslexic, something like this is really, really hard for me to understand. But it's all right, I worked it out, and I'm here to show you how to do it. So, first of all, you get this, okay? And so you pop that out, you just push it through the hole, there's a hole, okay? And then there's this little bit here. And this is actually super, super clever. I have to say, I'm really impressed with the design. There's Several things that you need to be aware of. I think they're in the instructions, but I keep getting lost how around about the middle. One is there's these little little nobbles, right? There's five little nobbles, and then on here there's five lines that match up to the nobbles. That's important. They should line up like that. So there should be a line pointing to a little knobbly bit. So I am going to make one of these green ones because I worked out that I need if I make six of each colour that means I need 14 different colours so I've got one of these so far so I need another five so I don't know what they recommend which way around they do it I can't remember it's it's 32 yo-yos later that I've, I'm doing this so what I did was I put this on the front of the fabric so that is the front of the fabric okay so I put that in there and then you get this bit and then you just sort of hold it until you can match it up, match it up with the knobbly part. So that's in place. On a thicker fabric, you'd hear it click into place, place but this is quite um, thin. So just make sure there's no folds or any gathers stuck in it or anything like that. And when you've got it in position, you need to cut it off and you need to leave enough here to fold over and stitch through. So you just cut that round like so. Keep going. Okay, that's what it looks like from the other side. It's it's quite rough. And then this is the bit that you need to be able to pull down and stitch through. If you're using um, a thicker fabric, you might want to use a thimble. The important thing is that these are lined up because these are actually your stitch holes. So if those bits aren't al aligned, you won't be able to get your stitches in the right place on the front. So what you need to do is start to the right hand side and then stitch across that way. We're, we're stitching from right to left. Just put the needle through and then pull it and then that's in place. So now, you see, you're gonna stitch back through here and your stitch is gonna be sitting on the fabric because there's like a little smile hole for the stitch to go through. Isn't that clever? So just keep going all the way around and just keep an eye about when you're gonna get back to your knot. I'll just say what I'm doing on every stitch is I'm just folding the fabric down as I stitch through so that it's in the right place. So there it is folded down and then let's see if I can show you that way. Put the needle through like that and there it is. Okay. This is my last stitch before I get to the knot. So when you get to the knot, which is right there, you have to have to stitch back through that hole without stitching through the knot. That's really important. And then you need to take your needle back to the wrong side, okay? Right, so we're ready to make the Suffolk puff, so throw your needle down, and then just push this off. Ta -da! And then what I do on this is just give it a little tug, just because it makes it nice and tight on this edge. And then you literally just pull it off like that. So that's done. So we've got a circle of fabric with a weird <laughs> frill on it. Where it's finished here and the needle's back on the wrong side of the fabric, you just start pulling. When you started pulling it a bit, it will go the wrong way around, so take a couple of seconds and just push it to the right side and then start gathering it up again. If you use um, too much of a hem on this, it can get quite fiddly at this point. Again, because this is silk, it's not really a problem. I can just tuck it all in. It's just going to do what I want it to, so... Just keep pulling. In the instructions, everyone says, oh, right, just tie a knot 
when you've got to that point. So, um, how? <laughs> so the best way I found, I did it a couple of ways when I said I referred back to the photograph. There's their photograph and they're all like, this one's well dodgy. There's, um, that one's quite good, that one's good. You can spend ages arranging them all so that the, they all go the same way round. Um, you know, like all the folds go around in a rosette. Honestly, I did that with the early ones. That could be why it took me so long. It's really not worth it. You don't you don't notice it. So they say to finish it with a knot. I say, having done it several ways, I tried doing that. But what I did in the end was I popped it like that so that I could get to where that thread comes out. And then make sure it's really tight. And then I just put um, a couple of stitches right close to the middle. And then... I'll do like a couple of slip stitches as well to finish it off and then I go over to the other side and get a couple of those as well and do some stitches through there too because I'm not confident that my knots will stay in. I don't know if this will stay in either but we'll find out won't we? So. And then the other way I did it was when I first started making them was I um, basically went backwards and forwards and tried to stitch all the bits in, which takes forever. And I'm not convinced that's any stronger either. So if you can tie a knot, great, you go for it. I can't, so I do it this way. So I don't think it's gonna come undone. Snip off your loose end and then you've got yourself a little yo-yo. <laughs> and that one's probably the best one I've done. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Look at that, it's all going the right way around. They don't they don't normally do that. So now I have another one for my collection. I've got two of those. I need to make another four like that and then move on to another colour. So I just wanted to show you how to attach them. So I'm going to attach them together first. All you do is you just stitch them together across this bit. So I would just say put them right sides together and you can see they're not identical even though they've been made on the same yo-yo maker so I'm just going to stitch together mm, probably about half an inch I'm using a knot so I'm going to stitch one way and then I'm going to stitch back across the other way so I've stitched as far as I want to and I'm just going to put a few stitches back the other way now and the reason why I did it like that was so I could hide my knot in the middle I do want a knot to make it more secure but I don't want it popping out and saying hello so and then I'll just uh, slide that over like that and also that way it means it's been stitched over in both directions so it's unlikely to come undone there it is stitched together I managed to get some fluff in it but you know and there it is unfolded you could stitch less of it together. I actually think it looks really cute. <laughs> so then I'm going to put this one on as well. So if I start in the middle here, I know that's pretty much the right place to start, which I think is about there. I have stitched three not terribly expertly together, but you get the gist. Actually, they do look really cute, and I do really like this rosette style on the front. I will concede that. So I am going to go away and make another lot of these <laughs> I can't think how many that is I'll go make another 52 of these to make into my cushion hopefully by the time this video has been edited the cushion will be ready to photograph <laughs> that would be nice anyway have a go nice to see you back again my review of this I actually think it's really clever I think it's really really clever I think once you get the hang of it it probably is quite quick for me I wouldn't be able to do this like in front of the TV watching something because I'd be because you've only got one so you have to cut out one at a time and you couldn't cut loads of circles and then do that because it's easier to cut them out one at a time because the fabric moves around so much so I don't know um it depends what you want I would say it is really really easy to use and there is one brilliant thing and that is that they do you know they're all the same size you know you haven't made a mistake on ironing or stitching or anything they are all the same size the only vagaries you've got is the thickness of the fabric. So thanks as always for joining me. I will see you again very soon uh, to give you a bit of an update. And um, But until then, happy sewing. Okay, bye.